Hi, this is Doug Kay, and before we start this week's show, I just want to let you know that I still have a few slots open in my street photography workshops in Cuba. The first one is November 2015, and the next one is January 2016. For more information, just go to DougKay.com and click on the workshops link. Thanks. Hi, it's Doug Kay, and I'm here with another episode of All About the Gear with my co-host, Gordon Lang. Good morning or good afternoon, Gordon. How are you? Good day to you. Fine, sir. I'm very well, Doug. Thanks for having me. Well, good. Uh, this is show number two with Gordon, and uh, we got rave reviews. I was fascinated, Gordon, by the, the ramp up in comments. We've had many more comments about the show since you joined. I guess that's your fame and popularity. It's my mum, I think, uh, under multiple identities. She's very, very good at doing this. Oh, very good. Well, thanks, Mom. We really appreciate that. Uh, today, Gordon is going to tell us about a, uh, a camera that has been anticipated for a while, which those of us in the U.S. can't even get our hands on. It's the Canon EOS M3. Uh, Gordon, why don't you just give us a little background on this camera? Yeah, so uh, for those of you who are watching the, the video now, you can see the EOS M3. This is Canon's third mirrorless camera. You may not have noticed that they made a second mirrorless camera, the M2, because it was only available in Asia. And now we have the M3, which isn't available in North America, but it is available everywhere else. And you can import it into North America if you are convinced that this is the camera for you. So I've been testing this pretty thoroughly for the last couple of weeks. So I'm really excited about telling you about what it can and can't do. But yeah, it's the Canon's third mirrorless camera, three years since the launch of the original EOS M. So give us a, the basic rundown of the, just this, you know, a high level overview of the tech specs on this thing. What, what, what are its features? What's it made of? Okay. So the first thing to say about it is that it has a brand new 24 megapixel APS-C sensor. This is the same sensor that they're using in the EOS 750D and 760D, which in North America are called the T. 6i and the T6s and I think we're gonna have a whinge about the different naming structure later on because it's certainly very hard for me to remember them all let alone anyone who has to buy the things so it's a new sensor it's Canon's first go at doing 24 megapixels in APS-C of course uh, Sony has been doing it for ages and because Nikon buys Sony sensors amongst others they also have been offering 24 megapixels it's the first time Canon has done it in APS-C so we can talk about that Canon has addressed an awful lot of criticisms against the original ES, EOS M with this camera. Um, I'll go over those as well. So, I mean, just the headlines are, it's 24 megapixels, it's mirrorless, it has an articulated screen on the back that I'll show you in a moment. It tilts back for selfies. Uh, 1080p movies, Wi-Fi with NFC. It's the usual kind of standard mid-range mirrorless specification. And at this, it's probably as good a time as any to mention pricing. In the UK, where it is available, it costs £550 with the 18 to 55 millimeter STM kit zoom that you can see right here. This is the same kit zoom that the original ESM had. In the US, if you're importing it, I'm afraid at the moment through sites like Digital Rev, when we recorded uh, this video anyway, you're looking at spending about a thousand US dollars, which is a little bit high for a camera this specification. It really goes up against models like Sony's A6000, which is comparably priced to this in the UK and in Europe. But in the US, an A6000 kit is typically about $600. So it's a lot cheaper. So again, you're going to have to have a very, very good reason to want to import one of these to North America if you decide it's for you. Yeah. Now, they've done a couple of things that are different. Let's see. We have a new pop-up flash. Is that right? Yeah. So let's, I mean, the... the the really cool thing about the EOS M3 is that these days when someone brings out a new camera, often there's one or two new features or slightly modified features and that's it. But with the M3, they've changed a lot, an awful lot. So you're right, uh, on the top surface, there is now a pop-up flash. If you're watching on the video, I've just popped it up. This, believe it or not, was not present on the original EOS M. It does have a hot shoe like the original EOS M. On, like on that camera, you can mount any speed light flash gun. But now there's a pop-up flash as well. And funnily enough, Canon told me, they said, you know what's really cool about this pop-up flash? You can bounce it. 
I was like, really? It's got a little kind of bounce facility. And he went, yeah, watch this. So this is how you bounce it. I'm going if to, you, if you're listening to the podcast, what I'm going to do is use my finger on the little spring-loaded mount and just pull it back a bit. And look, you've got a bounce flash. I was like, that's not a, that's not a feature. You're just holding it back. That's not. Well, you have to, you have to like actually hold it in position. Yeah, so you hold it. Yeah, unless I've really missed something. Now, I'm hoping that I've, I'm a bit daft here and there's a clip or a switch that I've not noticed yet, but I can't find it. So you've got to hold it. But it is possible to hold it with two hands and use your left index finger to just pull it back a little bit and look. <laughs> that's the bounce. That's you know, the bounce I, I expected you to, to demonstrate this by just holding your hand in front of the flash. So that was your bounce card. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's, here it is. Here's the bounce facility. <laughs> My uh, ghostly white hand. Okay. Yeah. So, so, and I'm also not sure. Looking at the size of the pop, I mean, it's a typical pop-up flash. It's not very powerful, so I'm not quite sure exactly how much light is going to make it when it bounces back off the ceiling. But you can, you can. It's a feature. <laughs> okay. But anyway, it's great. It's great that you've got it. I don't believe that you can use it to control, uh, be a wireless controller for the speed light flash guns. But I'm pleased to see it nonetheless. I like little pop-up flashes. They're great for fill-ins. You know, people moan about them, but I prefer to have them rather than not have them. So that is the first new and welcome upgrade over the EOS M. Well, that's exciting, isn't it? I'm excited. <laughs> now, what about an electronic viewfinder? Uh, you know, that's become pretty common in categories, uh, cameras of this category. Well, if I turn the camera around and uh, show you the rear panel, you'll notice there is no uh, built-in electronic viewfinder. Of course, if this were the Sony RX100 Mark III or the HX90V, you'd say, no, there it is. It's a pop-up one in the corner. But of course, well, I've just spoiled that by revealing that it is the flash. So there is no built-in electronic viewfinder on the MP, and that is its first big failing, although you can at least now mount an optional accessory on the hot shoe. You couldn't do that with the original EOS M, but you can with the EOS M3, and it's the same electronic viewfinder accessory that they sell for the PowerShot G1X Mark II. It's very high quality, although it will cost you about 250 bucks, which is which adds quite a lot to the, well, it adds exactly $250 to the price. And of course it adds a great big blob on the top. So it makes it a lot less charming and small in, uh, in my view. So I really wish they could have uh, built one in. At this point, it may be worth comparing it against the Sony a6000. Again, if you're watching the video, I don't need to explain what I'm doing. If you're watching the video, you can see what I'm doing. For those who are listening, I'm holding up the a6000 on top of uh, the EOS M3. They're roughly the same size, these bodies. I'll show you another view of them right there. Except that Sony has managed to squeeze in an electronic viewfinder in the corner there. And it's quite a good one as well. As you know, Doug, you've, you've got an A6000, I believe. So it's kind of, it's really annoying that the EOS M3 doesn't have it. It really needs it, I think. Yeah. So that's, that's its first major failing. But in Canon's world, where no other manufacturer exists, They'll say, well, you can have it. You can slide it on, and that's the problem solved. Yeah, you know, I just read your review, and for anybody else who wants to go to cameralabs.com, which is where Gordon lives. Uh, some people think he lives in the UK. Actually, he lives on the web. Uh, but cameralabs.com, where Gordon has just published his uh, EOS M3 review with far more detail than we could possibly do in this show. And uh, that's where I learn about everything, so check that out. Um, you know, one of the things. Let's look that, at the top. Two. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah, I know one thing that's going to happen in this this review, based on what you've written, Gordon, is that we're going to be continuously comparing this to the Sony Alpha Six Thousand, aren't we? Yeah, definitely, because it's also a mid range mirrorless camera. I think Sony normally would have updated it by now. Something has happened at Sony that is preventing them from updating it. I know they've had some worries. Maybe there's also been some technical worries, but the end result is that the A Six Thousand has had a lot longer shelf life than many of us expected and that in turn means it keeps getting discounted and now you can buy it for six hundred dollars us dollars in the kit or about five no 450 pounds in the uk with the kit zoom and that's just unbeatable value and yeah. i'm going to be more comparisons with that later I mean, but the, yeah the, go on the, sorry. Bod the body only here in the us just the body is 450 dollars uh i know, you, know you can't it's impossible to beat yeah, it's an amazing. So I, I think the the biggest problem they had is that you know that was camera of the year by many critics, and in, including me. Uh, it's just a marvelous camera. I mean, even though I have lots of expensive Nikon's and higher end Sony's, the A six thousand is a camera I take with me frequently for street photography. So, 
Uh, and also anything with a lot of motion, if I'm shooting people, mm. you know, running in and out, that kind of thing. But uh, the rumor, of course, is that there is an A6000 replacement right around the corner. So we'll have to see how, how that goes. But yeah, we'll keep, go ahead. We'll come back to the Sony, I'm sure, frequently. Go ahead with what you were going to show us there. So we're going to stay on the top surface here of the camera because you'll notice there is now a dedicated mode dial and next to it a dedicated exposure compensation dial. Now, of course, these are not particularly special on a mid-range mirrorless camera or mid-range DSLR, but they are unusual for Canon because the original EOS M did not have them. It was very much styled like a power shot camera. It just had, if you remember, a switch on the top that I think went from movie to, I think, uh, an automatic still mode and another mode. It had a three-position switch on it, and that was it. And you, you actually went between manual and aperture priority and all the other modes using the screen on the back, using a menu. So now it's really nice to have a dedicated mode dial, and as I say, an exposure compensation dial. One of the other things the original EOS M was lacking was a great deal of control customization. Now on the EOS M3, you've got a uh, function button on the front here, and two buttons on the back that you can also customize, including the movie record button. Now, this is quite an interesting thing that I, that I noticed. That's a good idea. The little red button in the corner, the movie record button, if you're not interested in movies, it's a bit wasted, isn't it? So it's nice that on models like the EOS M3, you can customize it to become a white balance button or an autofocus button or any number of other things. But here's the clever thing. When you put the camera into its dedicated movie mode using the top dial, this button returns to switching the recording on and off. But then when you switch it back to program, aperture, shutter priority, manual, or any of the still shooting modes, it goes to whatever you've customized it to do, which I think is a really thoughtful feature. It's little things like that that a lot of reviews don't really pick up on, but I think they're very important because they can really make or break a camera in daily use. It just these little features that can make things a lot easier. And if they're not there, they're things where you go, oh, I wish they'd done that. And hopefully that button is not in such a location that it's easy to hit by accident like it was on some of the original Sony cameras. Yeah, I think they've got the ergonomics right. And while I'm, while I'm looking at the top of the camera here, look at the grip as well. The grip is much bigger than it was on the original EOS M. Like I said, it was very power shot styled, the first one. It just had a little bump on the front. That was it. Whereas now it's got a very comfortable grip. And even though I'm going to spend this video saying how nice the Sony A6000 is, I really don't get on that well with the, their kind of block grip that they use. It's uh, To me, it's not very comfortable. It's more kind of about style than anything else, whereas the, the grip on the EOS M3 feels really, really nice. Right. Show, show us that LCD now in terms of what it's capable mm. of. Okay, so on the original EOS M, the screen was very much fixed in place. Now with the EOS M3, you can angle it down for shooting comfortably over the heads of crowds. Do you shoot comfortably over the heads of crowds, Doug? Yes, you all, the time. Doing that? all the time. <laughs> well, you can do it even more comfortably now. And more importantly, it angles up and up and up and up and up until it faces forward uh, to the subject. This is, of course, critical if you're shooting selfies. But without being condescending about selfies, it's also very useful if you're filming pieces to camera. If you're a video logger or you're filming video reviews, it's really, really useful to have a screen that points back to face you. So I like it. I like that they've done this. And this kind of makes up in some part for not having a viewfinder. And I should say it also inherits uh, Canon's excellent touchscreen interface. It is a touchscreen. You can touch to reposition the focusing area, swipe through images in playback. You can even tap your way very successfully through the menu system. Uh, even though the characters look quite small, it's quite easy to get around. I really like Canon's touchscreen interface. So it's nice that it has that. Now, you, you may know that that in the legacy of all the shows we've done here and All About the Gear going back two years ago with Frederick, Frederick and I have both become fans of touchscreens, and we get more, I, don't, I won't say hate mail, but something close to it for our fanaticism for the value of touch. What's your take on touchscreens in general? Well, I'm going to get the same hate mail because I love touchscreens, and once you've started using them a lot, I really miss them when they're not there. I reposition in the AF area a lot when I'm taking pictures. And I hate any camera that makes that difficult for me. And in fact, the A6000 does make it quite difficult for you to reposition the focusing area. You've got to press a few buttons before it lets you get to the point where you can move it about. And even then, you're moving it one step at a time using the rocker on the back. Why not just tap and you're there? Now, 
I'll admit that I'm not swiping through images in playback. I'm not pinching to zoom in. I never do that or very rarely do that. But I do use it a lot for repositioning that AF area. And even though I don't do it much personally, it is nice to be able to tap to pull focus when you're filming video. And that is another thing you can do with the EOS M3. And it racks very, very smoothly because it's got a hybrid AF system with phase detect AF points, which means it knows what direction it needs to start focusing and it knows when to stop without overshooting. So those racks look really nice. And I've got some examples of those at cameralabs.com. Yeah, so let's talk about autofocus now. So there's two autofocus mm -hmm. modes on all of these cameras. There's AF, we call them AFS, single shot autofocus, and then AFC, continuous mode, where the camera's tracking. How, how does this camera do in both of those two modes compared to, let's say, the A6000? Okay, well, I'm going to compare it, first of all, to the original ESM because that focusing was a big issue with that camera. It just wasn't very, very fast at all. And a lot of people really mocked it on that, quite rightly, because if a camera doesn't focus fast enough or it fails in some respect with focusing, it can be a very frustrating experience. Well, Canons make big claims with EOS M3. They say they've accelerated. I think they plucked a figure of 6.1 times from somewhere. I love I'm that. not quite sure. I, I love yeah, that. it's 6.1 times. Are you sure it's not 6? It's 6.1. <laughs> I measured it. Well, I'm not sure under what conditions it's 6.1 times faster or even three times faster, but it's a lot faster for single AF. In single AF mode, it's, I would say, as fast in good light as a Sony A6000 or A5100. Now, I've also got Panasonic and Olympus mirrorless cameras. I feel they are faster still in single AF. And in a crucial difference that, again, not a lot of people test or look at or compare, is how they focus in very low light. The EOS M3 is not fantastic in low light. It does struggle a little bit. So do the Sonys. But the Panasonics and the Olympus, especially the Panasonics, are very, very good in low light now. They can autofocus in ridiculously low light conditions. So once the lighting gets low, if the AF illuminator cannot illuminate the subject for some reason, either it's blocked or it's too far away, then this camera will struggle a bit. Now, in terms of continuous autofocus, I had high hopes because it has a hybrid AF system. Them, those embedded phase detect AF points I mentioned earlier, which should allow it to know how to continuously track something. And of course, it's something that works so well on the Sony A6000 and A5100. Well, I pointed this camera at some moving vehicles and people on bikes and anything else that moves around the Brighton area, I pointed this at. The one caveat being that the only lens that I could really test this with was the kit lens uh, at 55 millimeter f5.6. It's never going to be that demanding in terms of depth of field. But even under those conditions, it wasn't an amazing experience. Now, the pictures that I did take in servo AF mode were all in focus. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that it slowed the continuous shooting rate down to about two frames per second. Now, it wasn't that fast to start with. It can do about four and a bit frames per second when the subject isn't moving. But when the subject is moving, it slows down to about two. They're in focus but two frames per second is not very impressive. When the A5100 at a cheaper price will autofocus successfully on a moving subject at five or six frames per second, and the A6000 will focus successfully on subjects at 11 frames per second. Mm. So it's, it's still a little bit disappointing. It's a big improvement over the original EOS M, but it still falls down compared to current competition, I would say. We're, we're gonna come back to talk about autofocus and about the lens selection but you know the it seems to me that one potential class of buyers for this camera are people who are already in the canon family the canon ecosystem maybe they have a canon eos crop sensor camera you know an aps-c camera and maybe yeah. they've never used a mirrorless camera before so in terms of autofocus first and then in terms of other things in general if you're coming from a DSLR and you are going to try this camera, how is the autofocus going to feel to you? And then how is the camera overall? What's, what's it like switching? You think, of course, you, you use too many different cameras, but going from a, an APS-C Canon DSLR to this camera, what's it going to feel like? How's it going to be different? Well, it's obviously uh, quite a bit smaller. So you've got that portability advantage of, of mirrorless. In terms of focusing, Mirrorless cameras, well, they only have live view composition, whereas on a DSLR, there are two types of composition and focusing. There's using the optical viewfinder, 
and there's using uh, live view using the screen obviously with an optical viewfinder you can't use that in live view because it's not an electronic viewfinder it's an optical one but they have different a af systems i would say on a dslr normally if it's a mid-range or higher dslr you would find the autofocusing pretty quick through the optical viewfinder it's also normally quite effective at tracking moving subjects through the optical viewfinder when you switch them into live view and you're composing with the screen that's normally where mirrorless cameras have the advantage uh, but that's if they're using a completely native experience with a lens designed for it and a live view system and a sensor designed for it. Whereas I, I kind of get the impression that Canon, Canon's finding it very hard to be really 100% committed, I feel, to mirrorless because it uses other parts of the system or it relies on other parts of the existing EF ecosystem, as, as we'll discuss later on. It, you know, it really relies on people who have existing EF lenses that they that they want to adapt because there aren't a great deal of native ones available. The sensor, I also believe in this camera is the same, I think, as I said earlier, as in their latest two mid-range DSLRs. So you kind of wonder which system they're optimized for because it can't really be that well optimized for both because the sensor to mount distance is different. So... I would say if you're going from a DSLR, you would typically find the live view experience better on mirrorless. However, in this case, it would be similar because it's the same system as used on Canon DSLRs. In terms of the optical viewfinder on a DSLR, you'd probably get more successful continuous autofocusing uh, with burst shooting than you would with this particular model. But if you're comparing a mid-range DSLR against mirrorless in general, you would find that the mirrorless experience would be better, generally speaking, than the live view experience on the DSLR. All right, now, so it really boils down to whether you whether you like composing with the screen or an optical viewfinder. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm surprised, not surprised, but most of my students, when I first work with them, have never used live view in their DSLR. You know, they're used to taking pictures. And, and you know, that means that the the camera is using the non-live view autofocus, which is by necessity, as you said, it's only phase detection, where they have a separate phase detection sensor area, uh, a mm -hmm. unit that focuses the camera, um, which is generally, you know, quite good for continuous autofocus, uh, and but it doesn't allow the camera to see the whole image, so it can't do uh, some of the things that contrast autofocusing allows or live view focusing allows. Um, so it's just it's interesting because people it, it's actually technically it's extremely different from using the non live view mode in a DSLR, isn't it? Yeah, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't take into account when they're making these comparisons is the area over which the autofocus works on a DSLR. It's a little diamond area in the middle of the in the middle of the composition. Now on really high end DSLRs, it's a big diamond that covers a lot of the frame. But on a mid range or an entry level DSLR, that diamond can be pretty small and fairly sparsely populated with autofocus points. Whereas when you're uh, composing in live view, typically you can autofocus with al almost anywhere on the image. And in the case of the EOS M3 and the Sony A6000 and A5100, they have phase detect air points spread almost over the entire frame. Not quite the entire frame, but most of it. So if you've got something in the top left corner, it will focus on it, whereas a DSLR will not focus on anything in the top left corner through the viewfinder because there aren't any AF points there. So that spread of AF points is also worth considering. And I certainly find it useful when you're using face detection in live view because these cameras can pretty successfully lock onto and track someone by their face wherever they are on the frame, even if they are right pressed up against the edge, which you may want compositionally. Whereas on a DSLR, you're going to have to point at them and recompose. That is, of course, how we always used to do things. But these days, we've got very high resolution sensors that are very unforgiving on focusing errors. We have lenses with incredibly shallow depths of field that are again very unforgiving so the old i don't know if you found this doug when you're shooting portraits with a dslr through the viewfinder if you're using a very high resolution sensor and a, a, a extremely bright lens like an f1.2 lens or something like that if you do the old point and recompose you know you could be out that focus could be out by an inch or so and if you're talking about a depth of field that has even ears blurred then you're stuffed. The eyes are not going to be in focus. So people have to be very, very careful. And that's something that live view can um, can get around. Yeah, I've, I've started using, I never thought I would use face detection. 
uh, in a camera, but I found it quite helpful. Mm. So this uses EFM as the mount. How, how many uh, EFM lenses are available, and what do you think of them? You probably, okay, you probably so haven't tested them all, but well, it wouldn't be hard. In the three years, three years since launch, Canon has released the grand total of four, four native EFM lenses. Count them: one, two, three, four. There is the 18 to 55 millimeter, uh, 3.5 to 5.6. There is the 22 millimeter f2 pancake that it was launched with. Then after that, they released a shortish telephoto, just kind of standard telephoto zoom and a standard dish ultra wide zoom. Nothing spectacular about the apertures on either of those zooms. And that's it. Now, interestingly, those last two lenses are not sold, I believe, in North America. So if you're in the USA, you've got the grand total of two lenses, two lenses to choose from. And if you're in the rest of the world, you have four, four in three years, three years. And this is this Canon. Are they a, a small player in cameras? I, I don't know. Have you heard of them? Uh, I don't know. It, it, they're, 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 they seem to be new on my radar. Yeah, yeah. So that's what you'd expect. So it's almost one a year, one lens a year, which is not spectacular when you're ramping up a new system. Now, Canon would say, "Oh no, no, no. Wait a minute. You know, we've got everything from 11 millimeter to I think 250 millimeter times 1.6 in this range. If you can access all four of those lenses, but do you know what?" Only one of them has got an aperture brighter than f3.5. The, only one of them is a prime lens. None of them are macro lenses. Where are the interesting lenses? You know, this camera, the EOS M3, is aimed at enthusiasts. Enthusiasts like nice lenses. They want a portrait lens, a prime lens that's nice and bright, something around the 85 millimeter equivalent focal length, the f1.8 or 1.4 or even 1.2. Speaking of 1.2 lenses, almost all mirrorless systems now have a 1.2 lens, an exotic lens you can get excited about. You could rent it. Maybe if you've got enough money, you could even buy it, or you could just dream about it. Look at it in a catalog and drool over it. It's an aspirational product. There are no aspirational lenses in the native format for EFM. Canon would say, that's okay because you can adapt any of the EF lenses. And of course, Canon has the biggest lens catalog of anybody. I'm going to show you that right now. I'm going to take off the 18 to 55 millimeter. And here is my own EF 85 millimeter 1.8, which is a fantastic one of the first EF lenses. You, you know, it's very, very old, but still a goodie. And I've got the, uh, the adapter here. It, if you're not on the video, it's about one inch deep. And basically, this fills in the gap where the mirror went so that these lenses can focus. I'm going to pop it on now. And here is how it looks. Now, it's suddenly turned into a very, very chunky camera that feels very, very front heavy. The big grip certainly helps with it. But this is this is the EF. Uh, sorry, this is the EOS M3 with a nice, bright portrait prime. And I've got an example of some examples of how this lens looks uh, in my review. And it looks lovely, but this is not a combination that I particularly want to carry around. Now, let me show you a native lens of a similar focal length. This is the Olympus 75 millimeter f1.8, which is a really nice lens. Now, if I put it next to it, I've got to take the mount into consideration here. You can see that the mounted EF lens is about one inch longer and a lot fatter and a lot heavier than this lens. Now, of course, let's be fair here. The EF 85 millimeter is a lens that's corrected for full frame use, whereas this Olympus 75 millimeter is corrected for micro four thirds. It's a sensor a quarter of the area. Of course, it's going to be smaller, but that's the point. It's a it's a mirrorless camera. You've bought a mirrorless camera because you want something more portable, a nicer experience. Adapting lenses like this does not result in anything that's physically compelling to me, I don't think. But more importantly, the autofocus experience is not as good. Now, when I have this lens attached to the EOS M3, I found the AF speed reduced to at least one second under good light in single AF. In poor light, two seconds or more. In continuous autofocus, forget it, it just wouldn't work. And that was with a vehicle approaching at just 20 miles an hour. I mean, it's not that fast. It could not do it. Whereas... As a native lens, this Olympus lens, or indeed anything for Fujifilms or Sony system that's native to it, by native I mean designed for it, these focus extremely quickly. And just you say using this on an Olympus or Panasonic body compared to using this, uh, the EF 85mm on the EOS M3, it's a world apart. The EOS 
M3 really needs native lenses. I don't care that you can adapt EF lenses on it. I need. I want native lenses. And at this point, it's also worth noting that if the big selling point of the EOS M3 is the ability to mount EF lenses, it's probably worth pointing out that you can also mount them with an adapter on a Sony mirrorless body with a Metabones adapter and still have autofocus. Kipon have just announced uh, an adapter that allows you to mount EF lenses with autofocus on Micro Four Thirds. And if you're not bothered about autofocus, you can adapt them to almost any system. So this is not the exclusive solution for mounting EF lenses on a mirrorless body. And it's not that it gives it some, somehow a, a superior experience. So I, have, I have two questions about that. One is, well, first of all, is that adapter that you've got there, is that uh, passive or active? Does it have electronics in it? Or is it really just something to space the lens out from the sensor? Well, you can see it's got the points on it here. I've taken the lens off and I'm just showing you the, the points. It, it just kind of passes them through. So it does carry the EXIF information and the aperture control and, and you know, because it's all electronic on an, on an EF lens. So, yes, it is active in that regard, but really it's just passing on those contacts and adding the extra distance in the middle. But, but ultimately, I could kind of live with the fact that physically it's it's bigger. But the thing that I find it harder to accept is is that the autofocus experience reduces quite a lot, and suddenly it's not that compelling anymore, you know. And you've got to also think a Canon targeting this camera at people who are buying their first mirrorless camera, and this is going to be their only camera. Or are they targeting at people who have an existing uh, EOS DSLR and an existing collection of EF lenses? And for me, it has to be the latter, because if you're buying this just by itself, you're not going to go out and buy an EF lens for this. Why would you? Why would you buy this camera and then buy an adapter and buy EF lenses for an inferior experience? The only reason you would adapt EF lenses is because you already have EF lenses. This camera really has to be for DSLR, Canon DSLR owners who fancy a small body for for whatever reason but then you look at models like the sl1 which is the 100d outside north america and that's a pretty small slr dslr it's not it's not that new anymore but it, it's still pretty small and it's a it's a nice product so i'm i'm not quite sure who it's for mm -hmm. what what about canon users who have the the newer technology the stm lenses with the, the newer autofocus technology would you still give that recommendation, or does the do the STM lenses perform better than the other lenses? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I had completely forgotten about that. You will get a better autofocus experience with the EOS M3 if you're using STM lenses. Now, of course, Canon do STM lenses in the EFM mount, but also in the EFS mount. So if you're adapting those DSLR lenses with STM AF on them, you will get faster AF and you will get continuous AF, but it still won't be any better than a native EFM lens. And of course, the problem is, is that the only Canon lenses with STM, the only DSLR ones are, are a bunch of zooms really, right? I mean, there's a, the, there's a Pancake Prime, there's a couple of other ones, but there's, there's nothing like an 85 millimeter 1.8 as far as I recall. There's no really nice macro or professional grade zoom you know where's the 70 to 200 2.8 that's not an stm lens the this 85 1.8 is not an stm lens so again you've come back to the, the you know just a bunch of fairly normal zoom lenses which i'm not that excited about and if you're an enthusiast again which this camera is aimed at you may not be that excited either Hmm. What would you say? What would you say about the overall image quality of this camera compared to some of the, uh, you know, lower end Canon DSLRs in particular? Well, image quality was was one of the few things I didn't have a complaint about on the original EOS M, and I don't have any complaints with it here either. It's very, very good. This new Canon twenty four megapixel APS sensor, APS C sense. AP, I can't even say it. APS C. <laughs> it's so easy, isn't it? By the way, Doug, do you know why APS-C is the size it is? It's the machine. Well, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, because I, I bet you must have seen this as well. The machine that cuts them out, the actual, the, the, the machine that cuts out semiconductors, you know, that cuts out integrated circuits from a, from a silicon wafer, that's the maximum size most of those machines can do to, when it stamps them out. 
that's the size. So they went, that's the size we'll go for. And that's why full frame is so expensive because they either need to glue them together or have a special machine that, that can cut them out. And of course, you have a, a greater chance of there being an error in that area. But anyway, that's what I was told. I think I didn't tell now, uh, The reason I didn't answer the question is I didn't have any idea at all. So that's news to me. It's, a, it's an interesting reason. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah, sort of the, it's sort of yeah. the uh, the dog wagging the tail in terms of why something's developed that way. Um, yeah, exactly. So, right, yeah, so the yeah. image quality is very good. The image yeah. quality is very good on it. I would say if you look at my results at camelobs.com in the review, it's as good as existing 24 megapixel APS-C solutions like Sony's A6000. I found that the, um, the Canon turns up the contrast a bit more. The, typically, that's what they do with their JPEGs. The contrasts are a bit higher. The sharpening is a little bit higher. So it produces kind of punchier, more aggressive JPEGs out of the camera. But that's something you can very, very easily adjust. I, I'm very satisfied with it. And noise-wise, on the JPEGs with noise reduction applied, I'd say you don't really start noticing noise artifacts until 1600 ISO or above. And I, also, I always do raw comparisons with noise reduction turned off completely just to see what you've got to start off with. No one would ever use an image without noise reduction, but I post them so that people can see the information that is lost as the ISO increases. And of course, you see it pretty much from the start, but it doesn't really become an issue until 800 ISO and above. And of course, if you're applying noise reduction, it's not bad. I'd say it looks really good. It looks a lot better than I do if you're watching the video at the moment because the sun is shining through a window uh, in my house that has got slats on it. So you'll notice an interesting stripey effect on my face at the moment very much like adamant in the 80s in reverse <laughs> you're dating you stripe yourself, across right? my nose yeah, yeah i'm afraid so yes <laughs> <laughs> uh so you know you go you go to a smaller camera and one of the sacrifices or maybe one of the benefits is you have to go to a smaller battery what's the what the, oh. one of your i know i know this is one of your favorite oh. topics so I'm, I'm baiting you with this question talk to me about battery life and battery recharging the battery in the eos m3 is not big enough it lasts for about canon says it's good for about 250 shots that's of course with no video and no wi-fi i found i could get about 180 shots out of it with a little bit of wi-fi and a little bit of video sometimes less which isn't great but the biggest problem i have with it is that the indicator the battery indicator on the back of the screen is, is the old three icons you know three means full two means Two thirds full, right? One means one third, and then then it starts flashing, right? Well, I found while testing the EOS M3 that it would go from the two thirds to flashing red sometimes, just like that. It didn't even go to the the one third bit. It went straight from two thirds, which is you know, if my camera, if my battery's saying I've got two thirds, I feel pretty confident. You know, if I'm not going out for a deliberate shoot, if I'm just sort of casually wandering around town for the day, I'd be happy with two thirds, two out of three, right? However, I found with this two thirds can sometimes mean you are very, very close to having nothing left because it would go from two thirds to suddenly flashing red. And very shortly after that, it's game over. Now, this has caught me out a couple of times while testing the m 3 and it's very, very frustrating. What makes it more frustrating is that if you want to recharge this battery, you need to use the supplied external AC charger. Now, of course, this is Canon being very traditional. Some people really like that. They don't want to tie up their camera when they're charging. They, however, need to find an AC wall point if they want to recharge. And they have to remember to bring the charger with them. I don't want to do that. I prefer a more modern approach, which is what Sony does on its mirrorless cameras and Panasonic does on its smaller cameras, but not its bigger ones. I hope they change that in the future, where you can actually recharge these cameras over a USB connection. The charger is the camera you charge the battery inside the camera. Now, of course, that ties up the camera, but here's the good news. You can recharge it wherever there's a USB connection. You got a laptop with you, you can recharge it. You got one of those little batteries you use to top up your phone while you're out and about, you can use that to recharge it. You're driving from location to location or you're on a bus or an airplane with a USB port, you can recharge it. You can top these up under almost any situation without having to find an AC um mains connector on the wall and without having to carry something around so frequently what i'll do i've got one of those little um anchor uh, portable batteries it's a usb battery i always carry one around just a small kind of lipstick size one very nice work and i use that to top up my phone you know on a long day out but i can use that to top up the camera it means i can get some more pictures out of it i can do it while i, I recharge it in my pocket 
when I'm walking between locations or when I'm on the tube in London, on the train, you know, I just connect the battery to it and it starts recharging it. That's brilliant. I cannot do that with this camera because I need to find, I need to bring the charge with me and I need to find a wall mount. And that to me, I, I just think is inflexible. I know a lot of people would disagree with me. I know a lot of people hate USB charging, but for me, it's, it's the future. Plus, if you, you know, given that you, you need to have at least two batteries for this camera, if you're going out for a day of shooting, uh, if you only have the one supplied charger, you can only charge one battery at a time, even when you're back in a hotel room, let's say. Uh, and with the in-camera charging, that means you have the ability to at least charge two at one time. Yes, and I should add that I've owned a Sony RX100 since it was launched, which was, what, almost two years ago. I use that camera as my day-to-day -day kind of snappy camera. I've never, ever had a reason to buy a second battery for that camera because I can charge it over USB. I've never been caught out, ever, because I've either got that portable battery with me, I've either got the laptop with me, or if I'm on holiday, I've already got any number of AC to USB chargers with me, say for the iPad or for my phone or anything else, I can use those to recharge it. So I've never, ever had an issue with those. However, with the cameras that require mains charging, I have issues with them all the time. And especially with this one, if you run this camera, and Canon has done this before. I remember on one of the Super Zooms, one of the SX series, they had this problem where, especially when you were filming movies, it would go from a full battery or a two thirds battery to flashing red quite alarmingly. And sometimes when you switched it off and on again or went to change into a still photo mode, it mysteriously got all the charge back again. And you say, oh, actually I'm okay. But sometimes when you were doing movies or other things, it would appear to run out very, very quickly. And they fix that with a firmware update. And I feel they may need to do that with the EOS M3 because I, it's quite alarming how quickly it can go to that, that flashing red icon. Interesting. Okay, so let's try and wrap this up here. You know, we've com you've compared this quite a bit to the Sony A6000 and the A5100. Are there any other, uh, uh, two questions in one here, are there any other cameras you would like to compare this to and and ultimately who is this camera for is there is there anybody that you think uh, should be considering this camera I'm, I'm not sure there is given what you've told us well the good news is Canon has addressed a huge amount of issues with the original EOS M the M3 improves a lot of things it is a much much better camera than the original the bad news is is there are still better models available the a6000 to me is regardless of the price difference which is significant especially if you're importing in the us even forgetting about lenses lens selection just forget about all of that the fact that it's just well it's got the built-in viewfinder it costs less it's got effective continuous auto focusing even when you're doing continuous shooting the continuous shooting is faster it doesn't have a touch screen it's a 16 by 9 shape screen as well which doesn't look as good the pictures on them look really really small unless you're filming video but just that built-in viewfinder and the faster continuous shooting is hard to pass up at the cheaper price you should also be looking at things like the olympus epl7 or the epl6 in the us now is also available they have built-in stabilization a lot of style as well not a built-in viewfinder on those models. Again, that's one you attach on the top. Panasonic's uh, GF7, I believe. Again, no viewfinder built in, but a really nice little camera that's got some really cool ideas if you're into taking selfies. There's a, a mode on it where if you've linked it to your phone, you can use your phone to trigger it when you jump. It uses the accelerometer in the phone when it's in your pocket to detect you suddenly changing velocity and it takes the picture at just the right time so all those pictures people jumping in the air if that's your thing then there are some manufacturers that are really thinking about that samsung things like the nx3000 not a very new model but massively discounted and and a ton of features basically there's a lot of competition out there you know there's a lot of different cameras out there and canon i feel a lot of the time seems to develop in isolation it doesn't seem to be looking too much at what everyone else is doing i don't know if it's arrogance necessarily but just maybe they just never really looked mm. because if they did they would see that you know their competition are developing very very quickly and on a much faster product cycle but ultimately the lenses for me are the big issue you get a the, for the best experience in focusing and portability you need native lenses 
and there just aren't many native lenses in the EFM format. And those that are available aren't that exciting. It really needs a portrait prime, a macro lens, you know, some pro grade stuff. It needs, it needs something. It needs some, it needs, it needs something to show commitment to the format. I don't feel that Canon, I still don't feel that Canon is that committed to mirrorless. And the fact that they're not releasing yet anyway, the EOS M3 in the USA, what does that tell you? Why don't ask, American, I, I was oh, yeah, what, 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 well, what do why you don't, think? Why don't Americans, why don't Americans want mirrorless cameras? Because that's obviously what Canon think. Yeah. Well, is it that to... Americans like big, big cameras? I mean, mirror, when you look at global shipments, mirrorless cameras are most successful in Asia and in Japan. Partly, I think, driven by their love of new technology, but and also miniaturization. In America, forgive me if I'm wrong, but um, stereotypically, a lot of Americans like bigger things, bigger vehicles, bigger houses. You know, there's more space. I don't know if I've got it horribly wrong, but if that was translated into cameras, then DSLRs are the answer and mirrorless cameras may be too small. Maybe you guys have got bigger hands. You tell me you're an American, Doug. <laughs> Help me well, out. I, Throw me a freaking I, bone. <laughs> I, will not, I will not attempt to uh, decode the American psyche, uh, but, but you're right. Certainly, if you look at the st statistics of camera shipments worldwide, the U.S. is way behind Asia in terms of the mirrorless trend. Um, and, you know, the, the, the classic story here is, you know, showing up to shooting a wedding. Who's going to show up with a little micro four thirds camera when Uncle Bob has a gigantic, you know, Nikon D810, which is obviously better than any other camera because it's bigger. It's a, it's, an, it's a tricky one. I mean, I find it really interesting going to popular tourist destinations because that's where people have their cameras out and that's where you see photographic trends. And when I'm around Europe or Asia, there are lots of mirrorless cameras. They're very, very well represented, although still an awful lot of Canon and Nikon DSLRs. When I go to America, I feel I'm the only one who's shooting mirrorless, apart from two or three enthusiasts who, who like it. You know, when you go, when I go on photo walks, it's almost entirely DSLR. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with DSLRs, but clearly Canon feels for some reason that the EOS M3 is not for the US market. I, you guys tell us, you know, it'll be interesting to see if they catch on and if they do decide to try and market it in the US and then of course, whether it's successful or not. And, It'll also be interesting to see if they continue their commitment to the mirrorless product line or the mirrorless world. As you say, it seems like a, at best, a lukewarm commitment so far. Gordon, and it's I, I want to thank It's you. a shame because the, because the body, sorry, Doug, it's a shame because the body is so much better than the original. They've made a lot of, you know, I don't want people to go away thinking, oh, what a waste of time. They've made a lot of improvements. It's just that as a whole, it still has got some way to go. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Gordon, thanks a lot. I think we've done another great review. Welcome to uh, number two. And of course, if you're interested in purchasing an EOS uh, M3, regardless of whether you're in Asia, Europe, Canada, or even in the US, uh, we'll have a link where you can actually import that camera. Um, go to those links. Uh, it helps pay the bills. And uh, Gordon, we look forward to another episode coming up in the next few weeks of All About the Gear. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's been great. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.